Margaret Thatcher uh, famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. Well, we have not won the argument with the American people. The left has been so much more effective in communicating uh, their position of a right woman's right to choose than the pro-life people have. And we saw the effect of that in the election this week. Hi, my name is Anne McElhenney. Honey, oh. <laughs> what's my name? Phelan? Anne McElhenney. And what's your name? Phelan McAleer. And this is the... Anne and Phelan Scoop. Yeah, welcome everybody. So what do we do? What have we done? What have we do at the weekend, Anne? Anything interesting? We uh, well, we've been to, sorry, we've been to Texas since we last saw, last saw you. Um, Where are uh, we? We were in Texas. In fact, we did the podcast from Texas. Um, well, Phelan did the podcast from Texas. I was destroyed with a cold, which was not COVID, just to know. Well, that's correct. That's correct. correct. Yes. But I'm better now. More so, better now. So, Phelan, tell me about the podcast today. Who are we going to be talking to? We're going to be talking to Richard Vigory, uh, the founding father of, of American Conservatives, uh, the most, uh, the 87, is he 87, 87 year old, 89, 89 who nice. is the most fearless voice yeah. in American politics today. If you don't know Richard Vigory, you, you must know yes. Richard Vigory. When you hear our interview with him, you'll want to know Richard Vigory. Yeah. Uh, you just don't hear this kind of stuff coming out of DC. Yes. Uh, and you, you won't want to miss that. What else is on the show, Anne? And also COP27 is going on and on and on, apparently. Couldn't, like, I don't know. I don't even know when it ends. COP27. Is, that a, is that a reality show? It feels like a reality show, and I, we'll be we'll be bringing you some little bits of madness from the COP twenty seven ongoing negotiations. Negotiations. And hooray for Hollywood film. Hooray for Hollywood. Please Not so much. Sing. Don't sing, film. Go on ahead. I could have been someone. No. Not a singer. Many things, but possibly not a singer. Go on ahead there now. Hooray for Hollywood. If, if that guy can go on La La Land and sing, what do you call him? Ryan Stop it. There's Ryan. nothing wrong with him, actually. He's City, not as bad. City of Lights. Stop it. Okay, mm. tell me about it. Tell me about it. Oh, a great movie, but... City of Lights. Go on. I will sing Stop flat it. as hell. Stop it. I can I sing out of tune. He can sing flat. No, no, he's actually, he's fine. Go on ahead there, Phelan. City. Uh, hooray for Hollywood. Not so much. Hollywood discovers the downside of the di diversity hires. Really interesting article, by the way, from the New York Times. And yes. we have a fabulous recipe. It's actually winter has arrived in Los Angeles, shockingly. It's actually, look at us, look at us all dressed up. Burr. Burr, burr, the cold. Um, and it's actually vegan, but not even slightly tragic. So. And it involves an air fryer. It does As a weapon involve, of mass destruction. Well, it's very funny because, you know, I, I, it's almost like a joke at this point. You know, did, what did I cook? Whatever I cooked, I definitely used the air fryer. And I found a reason to use the air fryer for the soup recipe. Doesn't so make sense. Y it'll make a lot of sense in a minute. But anyway, but we're going to start by looking at what happened at COP27. The Cop, most recent. What you going to do? What you going to do? COP27. So I presume the 27 represents the 27 meetings they've had, right? Am I right about that? Look at, and look at the progress they've had. And look at all the progress. It's got colder yeah. By the hour. Yeah. So, so what is COP27 now? Uh, you know, and you know, it's the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meeting again. Shindig. Shindig. And now they're in Sharm el Sheikh. As we know, we spoke with Mark Morano last week, or mm -hmm. was it? Yeah, was it last week? And we had, by the way, loads and loads of technical difficulties with that interview because uh, basically, you know, this is the United Nations, by the way. And climate they conference. They're going to they're they're take over the whole world and decide we're going to change the climate. And what can't they do? Couldn't get the internet working in uh, Egypt. So, you know, like these are the people that are in charge. So it's kind of shocking, actually, you know, and, and we had Mark, who was very kind and patient with us. But I mean, he was trying, struggling to get the internet going. And we've, we've seen actually on Twitter and stuff, other people who were at that meeting complaining about, um, you know, yeah, exactly how well organised the UN. So they can't even organise a conference on organising how the whole world would be powered in the absence of fossil fuels. These are the people in charge. It's very, mm. very, very scary. But the other thing that's kind of funny, I just, this is three little moments from, from COP, from recent COP. You know, Rain Wilson, Rain Wilson, who's more famous as the comedian who was in the American version of The Office. Um, he played Dwight, was it Dwight? Yeah, and it was very funny, actually. It was very funny. So, you know, and this is so important. Important. And we're so wow! Thank you, Rain Wilson. He's changed his name to Rainfall Heatwave Extreme Winter Wilson to protest climate change. You know, which I, you know, isn't that something that we all didn't we all need that though? Thank you so much, Rain Wilson. And the other thing I really enjoyed was Bernie's tweets. She's she's she appears a lot on Twitter, and I really enjoy her tweets. And she's very smart. And she says, "COP 27, the food menu." And you will know that now all over the world, you've seen this thing of children being fed, children and grown-ups, and all of us. Uh, they're trying to push 
nutritious to eat bugs and less to eat no meat, basically. locusts and all that kind of thing. Because cows are, are... Or evil and they emit methane and all that sort of thing, right? Legitimate targets. However, then you go to Sharm el Sheikh and you find out what are they eating in well, a the, cup. The, the VIP cup. food What menu. are the VIP? So here's the VIP menu, you know, um, at cup where they're telling the rest of us we have to eat plants for the rest of our lives. Salmon with creamy sauce and yum and chive and basmati, basmati rice. Angus beef medallions with mushroom sauce and sauteed potatoes. By the way, look at the price of that. The Angus beef medallions with mushrooms and, and sauteed, sa- sauteed potatoes is a hundred dollars in yes. Sharm el Sheikh. Grilled, the next one is grilled sea bass. I thought, I thought eating sea bass was almost akin to drowning, murdering, murdering your own children or, or something. Or drowning kittens. Or drowning kittens, which we've had a conversation about drowning kittens. People in Ireland used to do that. Don't write to us about it, please. But apparently it was a thing. They used to throw them into the sea. They put or them into the a plastic bag and then throw them into the sea. Bog holes. More. If you were inland, not that I'm saying anyone I knew who did it, but let's say if you lived in an inland county in Stop Ireland it. like Tyrone, we don't know where had a lot it. of bogs, we don't know where and you had a farm it. where kittens were overpopulating. And by you the way, the may fourth, have. the fourth item on the menu. The can fourth I, can item. I ask a question? I want people. If you lived in a farming location in America, can you tell us your kitten experiences? What happened to the kittens that were born on the farm in the days before cats were being neutered by or, by the local vet? Or or were being sheltered or being adopted. Either. Moving on. The fourth item on the VIP menu is again another beef item. It's marinated grilled beef with grated potatoes, root vegetables and green pepper sauce. Hmm. $35. Interesting. Hmm. So just so the to VIPs say, are not going to sacrifice. They want you to sacrifice, but they're not going to sacrifice. They're going to ask you to eat locusts, by the way, apparently. Apparently very, very, apparently you can deep fat fry them. So yeah, no locusts for us though, thanks very much. And you'll never be getting a recipe for locusts from me, no matter if I live to be a thousand, just saying. Even if there's a plague of them. And my third little snippet from, uh, from COP27, which I just adore, and I just saw it as I walked in here to the studio to our new lovely home here, by the way. Yes. Don't you love the decor Have and everything? Noticed? Have you noticed that we moved into something more professional looking oh, oh, oh. than our house? Our but garage. My last one that I just saw before I came here and I just thought it was so fabulous, Phelan, was, you know, and literally this is just hot off the presses. Biden has met Xi, um, the Chinese leader. Um, a dictator. To, and basically, the, a dictator. And, you know, that's, the, that's one where it's being nice about him, right? Yeah. The Chinese murdering dictator, by the way, you know. They've just met and, and, and pledged cooperation over COP27, over the COP, tw- you know. So are, isn't that very reassuring to know? And there's the photograph of the two of them, all smiles there. And I'd say Chairman Xi must be so amused. So happy. So amused, by the way, to be talking to Biden, who, God help him. Who wants to shut down fossil fuel extraction whilst, whilst she is building a, a is coal building a plant. coal plant every second weekend right yes. basically For, it's, a, it's a hobby you know he's basically using every possible fossil fuel and of course he's going to say that he's going to cooperate and then he won't because making agreements with the Chinese I mean honestly this is this is these are the people who are in charge and it's very very scary and these, these are the people and just to remember when you think about um, you know who these people are and I mean there's many obviously many questions these are the people they just lie about everything you know, these are the people who lie about everything. They lied about how many people died in COVID. We know about that. Mm-hmm. They lied about the number of people who died with SARS. You know, they were pre- they were prepared to let the whole world die of these diseases while they lied and, and continue to lie, by the way. They'd be the same boys. They'd be, they'd be a bit fond of that Islamophobia. Oh, they? and they'd be fond of the Islamophobia, which apparently the rest of us are all hate-filled. Oh, we are, but oh, we're know. hate-filled. Well, but you, you know s- what? <laughs> Our hate-filled thoughts are nothing compared to labour camps in China. I would call them concentration camps. And uh, even concentration camps. Where they concentrate on killing people. We're going to go over right now to uh, to talk to our friend um, Richard, our dear friend, by the way, Richard Vigory, who is the founder of American Target Advertising. So what's prompted this was we got a mailing for him after amazing after the uh, recent midterms. Yes, midterms. And it was just struck us as so truthful, so honest, so forthright. We just felt we had to have him on. And so not talking pointy. Yes. This is a great thing about Richard and you'll hear him and you'll yes. hear his energy. You'll want to um, turn up the volume, sit down, make yourself a cup of tea. Make yourself a cup of tea because this guy is great. We're going to go with that right now. We're very glad to be joined now by our dear friend, Richard Vigory. Hello, Richard. Good morning, How? Uh, and film. Good to be with y'all. Very good. Richard, of course, is most famous for inventing direct marketing for political purposes and by doing so, transforming politics in the 60s and, and 70s, 70s um, and continues to do so today. And I, the reason we've asked you to come on, Richard, is obviously there's been this uh, massive disappointment with the, lo- the recent elections. And you wrote the best thing I read 
of anybody writing about what happened. I thought your your letter out to um, the conservative movement was extraordinary, and uh, I want to. And I just I really want today to quote some of these sections back to you and ask you to to dis, you know as they said as they, the worst the worst ever questions at high school were a big paragraph and then underneath it discuss so i'm going to do that to you richard so here's the first one conservatives are like the biblical jews who had to wander through the desert for 40 years until that generation of failed flawed leaders had passed away Conservatives are not going to get to the political promised land until this generation of failed, flawed leaders are replaced and new ones arrived. Discuss. <laughs> and, and I suppose we should say you're talking here about <laughs> conservatives, not Republicans. Yeah, I uh, uh, I felt this way uh, for the six. I've been involved at the national level now for sixty years, uh, going back to 1961, and uh, in those days. Conservatives needed a lot of things like we need now. We need more uh, organizations, more candidates, more elected officials, more money, etc. But the number one thing we needed in 1961 and we need now in 2022 is leadership. For whatever reason, the good Lord has seen fit to bless the left with far more effective leaders that, than we have. And uh, I, like you and Fem, I know most all of the national conservative leaders. Many of them are friends of mine, but quite frankly, they have low energy. The left leaders seem to have so much energy, you could cut it with a knife. Not so 90% of the conservative leaders. They, uh, they mean well, but they just uh, lack uh, that energy. I wrote an article in March, months before the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade came out, saying that the pro-life leaders were not ready to win. They didn't had not prepared the American people uh, for this decision. Margaret Thatcher uh, famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. Well, we have not won the argument with the American people. The left has been so much more effective in communicating uh, their position of a right woman's right to choose than the pro-life people have. And we saw the effect of that in the election this week. Let, let me just make one other point. In November of 2016, when Trump was elected president in 2016, Planned Parenthood had 400,000 supporters. Twelve months later, they had a million six hundred thousand. They had grown 400 uh, percent. I don't know of any pro-life organization that has 100,000 donors out there. Uh, the uh, uh, pro-abortion people outraised the pro-life people by something between a thousand and two thousand percent they have a thousand percent more supporters uh, so that's an example of the leadership is just not there and if we're going to uh, save western civilization it's going to be young people that are going to come on the scene and do it it's interesting, actually, this, you know, I mean, that that point you just made about Planned Parenthood versus the pro-life movement. I mean, the pro-life donors and the pro-life activists and people who care about this issue. I mean, for me, I, it's it surprises me that, wh wh that there's something kind of, there's a very big flaw there because people who care about the pro-life issue, it's almost the only thing they care about. I mean, and they're very, very passionate and, and committed and all of that. And how is it? How is it that that does not translate into money, into people, into donor? How, how is that that doesn't translate? Because apparent, I mean, for me, it's like the most important issue of all. It makes everything else pale in insignificance. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, our people, and and you know the conservative leaders as as I do. They're they're good people, heart of gold, and all. But they, uh, it's it's not their religion. It's not their their. You know what they get up in the morning. They they've got a family. They've got a community. They've got their their work, uh, etc. And uh, for the left, this is their this is everything. There's nothing beyond this life, you know. And it's this is uh, everything for them. And it's a it's a religion for them. And uh, they just throw everything into it. Uh, and our people, it's one of many things that they do. Uh, they're mostly concerned about their family, their community, their neighborhood, etc. And it's just not uh, the end of everything, but it is the end and the beginning of everything for 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 the left. Okay, in defense of the pro-life leadership, who are who many of whom we know well and are great, as you say, are great people. Look, the culture 
Hollywood, uh, Hollywood uh, has has made this an issue. Has made the pro life, and, and and this is this is a wider topic about transgender, uh, about republicanism, about conservatism, immigration, immigration. <laughs> yeah. So we watch. We are big uh, consumers of bad TV. You know, of, of prime time TV. We watch it so you don't have to. Chicago Med. New Amsterdam, <laughs> the residents. Law and Order, SUV, SVU, you know, all these. But every one of them have had several uh, pro-abortion pro euthanasia, pro, pro storylines uh, since uh, and even before uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. They are winning the culture left, right and centre and everywhere in between. And it is more difficult, therefore, for the pro-life leadership to break through when the culture is held in a stranglehold by the left. Oh, absolutely. Uh, to show you how, you know, we're, it's uh, Western civilization is just uh, hanging by a thread. Uh, the, the left seems to be on our 10, 20 yard line and uh, there's not much between them and the goal line, but, but there is a little bit. Uh, professor Harry Jaffa, famous uh, college professor from Claremont Institute who died a few years ago, uh, wrote in 2014 that Western civilization survives, he said, because of America. And then he said America survives because of the conservative movement. I've added the conservative movement survives because of a few hundred of us. And literally just a few hundred conservative leaders nationally keeping the left from the goal line. And uh, we, uh, we need so many. One of the solutions that coming out of this election results that was so disastrous is we need, you know, the new leaders that you talked about and uh, younger leaders, etc. And uh, and uh, the uh, the problem, quite frankly, is not at the grassroots. The grassroots is on fire. They're angry. They're worried. They want to do something. They're looking for that leadership. And that's what we need uh, more than anything else, that leadership. If the leadership is there. The troops are there to be uh, to be led. I, I have to say I, I disagree with Richard Vigory. Oh, my God. Yes, I disagree with him. I'll a, deal with him later on, Richard. Don't worry. Is that allowed, Richard? I don't think young leadership is, is what's Funny, needed. that was my one. When, we, when, uh, I went, when I went through your letter, it was the one thing I said. I'm going to pick a, pick a fight with Richard over the youthful thing. Under 40. We were, I'm very hurt by the under 40 thing. Especially, Phelan. Richard, I, I, want, that, I want Richard Vigory to lead the Conservative yes, movement. Yes, yes. You're younger than, I can tell you, I've met a fair few of these under 40s in the Conservative movement and you would wipe the floor with any of them, Richard. I'm, uh, I'm uh, 89 years old. I uh, literally, literally work 11, 12 hours a day, five and a half days a week. Love every minute of it. Been blessed with good health. And I say that my role model is Moses. Deuteronomy 34, verse 7. And Moses lived to be 120. And his eye was not dim, nor his vital forces abated. And I've got a lot of liberal friends out there, quite frankly, at the national level. And, uh, you know, Moses lived his life in three 40-year compartments. 40 years in the house of the Pharaoh. 40 years in the wilderness with his family. And then when he turned 80 is when 99% of what we know about Moses, when he turned 80, he began to lead the Israelites. So I tell my uh, liberal friends, look out, Vigory is just getting started. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, yeah. yeah, so you, you, you know, everything you wrote, by the way, in that recent uh, epistle was great. The one thing we, as I said, we pick we pick a fight with you on the, for, on the under 40 thing. But you, are, but you also talk <laughs> about um, cleaning... You also talk about cleaning house and you, I mean, this is one of the things that I love about you, Richard, is that you just don't pull your punches. Unlike so many of these weasel worded, you know, pundits uh, that you and have. Consultants. And consultants. That awful consultant class. By the way, he has a fabulous phrase for the consultant. You call them content free. I, I wanted, you, I wanted to read ask the, read you... Read the quote. Read the full quote. This quote. All right, I'll read this quote. As I said, I just want to read the, uh, lots of quotes from what Richard wrote. Here's another thing Richard wrote. He said, There needs to be a major house cleaning at the National Republican Committees, starting with Rona Romney Daniel, McDaniel at the Republican National Committee. Uh, yikes. That's me saying yikes, by the way. But also at the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, the Republican Governors Association, as well as the cabal... This is I love this. As well as the cabal of content-free consultants who play a major role in making sure the Republican Party and Republican candidates avoid conservative issues. Yikes. I like that. The, I like that we, so When much. we studied that at school, we'd call that alliteration for effect. Cabal of con content-free <laughs> consultants. 
Yeah, we love the we don't love the cabal of content free consultants, but unfortunately, we've yeah. met them. Discuss. Discuss. No, they're uh, they're uh, they're the bane of our existence. They uh, they really uh, have done a lot of harm to to our cause. You know, they uh, they they caused the, uh, the Republican Party not to have an image out there, not to have a, a brand. What what does the Republican Party stand for? Uh, the uh, you know, it, the Bible tells us if the trumpet doesn't sound certain, who's going to prepare themselves for the, for the battle? And so these consultants avoid conservative issues and the Republican and the voters at the grassroots level, they don't really have a clear image of what the Republican Party stands for. I mean, some are uh, on this issue. Some are want to grow government. Some want to cut government uh, and uh, some uh, avoid co uh, the cultural issues. Uh, some of us uh, very feel very passionate about the cultural issues. There's, there's, uh, and the consultants contribute greatly to that lack of an image for the uh, uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, for almost a hundred years, starting in the early 1900s, the Democrats, the left, did a very good job of branding the Republican Party as the party of rich, uh, Wall Street big business, trickle-down economics, and that won them a lot of elections. Now, that's not true today, of course. They've become the party of the rich and uh, the elite, uh, etc. But it is now our responsibility, our opportunity to brand these people. They have gone so far to the left, yep. they're going to fall off the planet. And uh, yep. it's up to us conservatives to provide the leadership. Not the Republicans, not the people at the Republican National Committee, not the congressional leaders in the House and the Senate. It's up to conservatives at the national, state, and local level to provide that leadership. And uh, if we do and brand the Democrats as anti-God, uh, anti-American, anti-police, elite, yep. socialist, anti -family. We, can, uh, yep. we, we can make the Democrat Party so toxic they're going to have to change the name. As you say, we're not. No one's done that, right? And and you know, I don't know if you heard the Dave Chappelle Saturday Night Live uh, yeah, cold open. Cold <laughs> open. Uh, I mean, it's 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 worth listening to. But actually, he. I mean, this is this brings back the the elephant in the room, and, and I don't want to refer to Mr. President Trump as the elephant, but he is. I mean, he, Dave Chappelle. You know, part of his cold open on Saturday Night Live was him reading answers Donald Trump gave in the first presidential debate. That's how important Donald Trump was, by the way. Donald, he, he just... Not, not, this, not this most recent SNL. Yeah, sorry, the, um, not, the, not the most recent SNL, but the most recent, uh, sorry, the most recent election, the, the one with Hillary Clinton. So Dave Chappelle said he lives in Ohio and he knows why people in Ohio like him because he, he hangs around with, the, he says, I hang around with poor white people. And he says, remember that first debate? Hillary Clinton said, you don't pay any taxes. Donald Trump says, that's because I'm smart. And uh, and he says he says you know what he says Hillary if you don't like it why don't you change the tax code and you know what you won't change the tax code because all your donors and friends benefit the same way I do mm -hmm. right and Donald Trump branded Hillary Clinton as a friend of Wall Street and the rich in that debate and and Dave Chappelle was admiring of that and got a laugh from the audience because of that but no one has the guts or the or the or the or the smarts to do that. Apart from Donald Trump, you know, he branded Hillary Clinton as a friend of Wall Street. He branded her as a person who gives secret speeches to bankers. One of the uh, huge mistakes that the Republican Party and the conservatives did too, quite frankly, make in this last election is that they failed to give the voters a tune to whistle. Uh, you've got Reagan did that. Uh, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Uh, we had a governor here in Virginia years ago, uh, George Allen. He said, if you do the crime, you do the time. Uh, and so the Democrats gave the voters a tune to whistle, two tunes. One was democracy is on the ballot and a woman's right to choose is on the ballot. The Republicans didn't give the voters any tune they can whistle. Uh, Trump, uh, you referenced him, uh, in 2016, came up with the best tune in 40 years since Reagan. Make America Great Again. That's a tune you can whistle. How do you whistle inflation or, uh, or crime <laughs> or uh, open borders? Yeah. They didn't give the t voters a tune to take to the polls. And you know, the only tune going on in people's head was what the Democrats gave them. Democracy is on the ballot. 
and a woman's right to choose is on the ballot. And the Republicans, uh, with their consultants out there, were coming up with nonsense, uh, you know, commercials, and people don't remember them. And it, we, in my lifetime, I've never seen the issues that were so favorable to Republicans and conservatives out there. It should have been a tsunami of a victory, uh, and it wasn't. And all because of the re lack of leadership at the congressional national level, the consultants, uh, the Republican National Committee, they failed us. They failed the American people. I think uh, just and just to give you a plug here, Richard, not that you need more, you know, a plug, but you but to, to, like credit where credit is due. You wrote a book called Go Big. You actually predicted this. You said in your when in, did when did Go Big come out? In when, when did Go Big come out, Richard? Uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Brand new. Hot off the press. Yeah. But you wrote it prior to the midterms. You wrote it prior to the midterms. And you basically said you predicted this. Go, go big. And uh, it says uh, the, the marketing secrets of Richard A. Vigory, how conservatives can win with bigger and more organizations, donors and, mo and money. I lay it all out here. It's a roadmap for us to come to power. By the way, I'm just saying, and give to give you credit, Richard, you said in that that this, you were concerned. This, this is a quote. Before, this is a, direct this is a quote. quote. Yeah, this is a quote from the book. This is before the the the, the you know the midterms. You said, "I'm yeah. concerned that many conservatives think there will be a red tsunami wave that will wash Democrats out of office in November 2022," um, and they, they be, and so they believe they don't have to do anything because victory is close. All we have to do is keep doing what we've been doing for the last 30 years, and we will have a big victory in November 2022. I I mean, you were you were spot on the money there. You were like, you know, this is how good you are. Yeah. I mean, you 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 know you you, you say most Mar ma Martin Blackwell called this the strain of thought succumbing to the Sagalahad theory of politics. We will win because we are self evidently yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. No, this is all very very true. We could see it coming out there, you know. But uh, you know, I think uh, all of us, myself included, were deluded a little bit. We thought, my gosh, you know, with. Uh, 80% of the American people thinking we're countries going in the wrong direction and, and the unpopularity of Biden and Harris uh, and the open borders and inflation. We thought, uh, you know, that uh, we would do far better than we did now. But uh, the, the Democrats, they, they're, they're, you know, they're so much smarter than the Republican leaders are. They decided they wanted to run against uh, these issues on abortion and democracy is on the ballot. And then they also not only decided they wanted to run, but they wanted to run that against certain candidates. So they went out and got the candidates that they wanted in New Hampshire, in Arizona, in Georgia. They selected the Republican candidates by spending tens of millions of dollars in these primaries. Uh, that's brilliant leadership. Where is the Republican leaders that can compete with them? Well, that brings me to an interesting. We're recording this show in advance of the, the 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 announcement that will be made later on in a few hours from Donald Trump. Um, so we, I just want to maybe get your feeling on that because you're pretty you're pretty good at doing these predictions. Do you think he's going to go? Do you think it's a good idea? Um, what's your take on what what may be happening in the next few hours? I, I you know, I don't know if he's going to go. I assume he's going to go. Uh, the second question you ask is a good idea. No, it is not a good idea to uh, to support somebody, to nominate somebody that half of the country hates. They don't just not like him. They hate him. Uh, and uh, I've not seen any polls where he's more than 42, 43, maybe 44 percent popularity in the polls. And to uh, we if we went again with a younger candidate, somebody that uh, fresh and new and is a solid movement conservative, I think that we can have a huge victory in 2024. But uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm really glad uh, Donald Trump was there uh, in 2016, but I think his time has come and gone, and it's time for others to come on the scene. Hmm. I 100% I, I agree with you. I just the young, the word young is the, is the major. It's the one that you have a problem yes, with. Because, uh, by the way, there was nobody fresher. <laughs> there was nobody fresher in politics than Donald Trump, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. To be so honest. the actual, yeah, the number of years doesn't seem to be a thing. It's, the, the fre uh, it's fresh in whatever sense that is. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily get dictated by the, by the number of years. Which, which brings me to my last question, because we're, we're wrapping it up right yes. now. So basically, and it's kind of, more, it's more of a personal question. Um, 
you are very inspiring to me, Richard. I have to say, I was telling someone about you yesterday and I was saying that, you know, when I go to those con- those conservative conferences and if I, and I look down, drearily look down through the number of people speaking, whatever, if I find out that you're speaking, I'm like, OK, all is not lost because, you, you know, I'll get to hear someone energetic, fun, with fresh ideas and... Just with that kind of infectious enthusiasm that is so lacking uh, in conservative movement, I would like to ask you, on a more kind of personal kind of life skills basis, you are 89, as you said, and work 11 to 12 hours a day, five and a half days a week. Can you give us your secret and give our audience the secret of staying so positive and so energetic and so much fun? Well, you know, since I was a a young child, I... uh I've been uh, just consumed uh, to uh, to save Western civilization, uh, and uh, I uh, uh, I started life uh, not as a conservative, but when I'm 13, 14, 15 years old, playing uh, cops and robbers with the kids in the neighborhood, I don't I tell anybody, but I'm not shooting robbers. I'm shooting commies because I just came into this world knowing <laughs> communists are evil people and uh, I'll leave this world knowing the same thing. But I just have a, uh, I'm just driven to, uh, to, to be responsible and to, you know, the Lord does not require me to succeed, but it does require me to, uh, to, to try and to be faithful. And uh, I'm driven by my faith uh, in God and Jesus that I'm, obligated to go out there and help my fellow man and that's what drives me i just i've read that bible from cover to cover held it every way you can uh, hold it and i can't find the word retire in there if ever i do i'm out of here but uh, in the meantime i've got to be busy with the lord's work yeah well we we're very grateful for you richard where where can people find you uh, you know how, how do people find more of your work because uh, give us the name of the book again. I've got a uh, website, conservativehq.com, uh, where I uh, daily uh, put information about the conservative movement and how we advance the cause at conservativehq.com. Also at Fed Up Pack. Fed Up Pack. Buy, read, go big, and, and let's go big, conservatives. Bye, All Richard, right, Bigger. Richard, thank you so much for your time, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank Bye, you. Richard. Bye-bye. I don't know many people in their late 80s with Richard's kind of energy. And yes. I just think um, he is, he, he, I, it's funny, you know, obviously Phelan and I, we, you know, we meet, we meet up with Richard every now and again. And it's like, if you see him in a crowded room, basically, or a crowded conference, he's the guy. Yes. He's the guy you want to talk to because nothing Richard says isn't fresh. Nothing he says sounds like something manufactured yes. by by Kevin McCartney and the rest of <laughs> McCartney. Did you hear me? Kevin McCarthy and the rest of them I and Rona and all of that crowd. I remember. Remember he was telling, you know, about 10 years ago when we so first funny. heard him, you know, the Internet, five things you need to know about the, about the Internet. And the fifth, you know, and all these good things, where the oh, Internet's yeah, yeah, going. Yeah. And the fifth thing, uh, nobody knows nothing. Anybody who tells you they know where the Internet's go- going to be in five years is a liar. Is a liar. Don't yeah. believe them. Is a Run charlatan. Away. Yes. Run away. None of nobody, us know. Yeah. Nobody, no, nobody knows anything. Yeah, so nobody knows anything about what's going to happen next. Yes. And uh, what, a, what a great guy. So, so that's what so many, it's like you never hear that at any of these conferences. Everybody knows everything. Yeah, but yeah. Richard, I mean, he's really, it's honestly, when, when we've gone to those kind of conservative conferences and you see him on the schedule, it's like, yeah. you know, this is the one guy you need to hear because he really is youthful and in his thinking and very fresh and he's just he just knows everything he yeah. really genuinely knows everything when it comes to the conservative movement yeah. okay so, Philip tell so, us about Hollywood hooray for Hollywood well I suppose it all gets back to Karl Marx of you, course it does yes so I mean Karl Marx was wrong about so many things wrong about humans humanity what motivated them what made them tick he was wrong about how to make the world a better place uh, and you know and his followers uh, murdered about 100 million people uh, and made the world a much more miserable place for billions in China, Africa, uh, and South America. And Marx was so, so wrong about controlling the means of production. Uh, um, he was wrong about that. He, uh, controlling the means of production is not important. Uh, and there's nowhere more evident than that than modern day Hollywood. It's never been cheaper uh, or easier, actually, to produce, you know, quality content. Mm-hmm. You don't need big film cameras. You don't need 
uh, massive sets. You can CGI everything. Uh, you can film a, a movie on an Apple phone. Um, and despite the best efforts of unions to price themselves out of work, it's it's cheap t- to produce now. Uh, but Hollywood is still in trouble. Hollywood's in, in the biggest trouble it's ever been. You know, it's like uh, box office is is almost not quite at all time. Like it's a twenty year low. TV stars such as Trevor Noah, like you know, the Daily Show, it has it has a million viewers, and and only a hundred thousand of them are worth advertising to in the advertising demo. Like so, he he has a hundred thousand people watch. You know, apparently according to the ratings, I'm not even sure about that. You know, Johnny Carson at his height was. I'm watched by 35, 50 million people uh, with a much smaller population in America. So st- streaming services are struggling. They and they keep, uh, things keep getting more expensive and they, they, they keep pushing this increasingly woke content in, in front of a, an increasingly disinterested audience. You know, there's an actual woke arms race going on in Hollywood at the moment. Uh, and it's a war that everyone is losing, but no one seems to care. Like Because for, for every top Gun and Maverick and every the Crown. There, are, there are do- dozens of expensive failures that like they don't don't even get close to failing to launch. That that's the thing. Like they don't even you know you know failure to launch is one thing, but imagine not even be good enough to to get out the gate. You know, for example, the only thing funny about the gay rom com Bros. Yeah, oh dear Bros. Wow, like the gay rom com Bros. Was it the only thing funny about it was this ticket sales? Oh, Phelan. What? That's no. very bitter and twisted, but going no, ahead. But, uh, That's very funny, actually. Well done, you. Sorry, I'm meant to be the comedian around here, but anyway, going ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, well, as I say, Anne's comedy relates to telling my stories with a slightly comedic twist. Not true. This is not not true. I have quite a lot of original material. <laughs> you didn't come up with the story about the sourdough bread. Go on ahead. This is true. Rose release, and I've done the, the, the figures on this. Rose release, the movie, was so wide in so many theatres, and its box office so low, it literally played to empty theatres across America. Oh, my God. And, you know, remember the Olivia Wilde movie, Don't Worry Darling, which, yes. was, which was going to expose toxic misogyny. No one cared to go and see it. Like, no one, no one. And then, apparently, there was a comedy, Easter Sunday, which the New you York... never even heard about it. Exactly. You've never heard of that, right? No, never New heard New York it. Times described it as a, quote, watershed moment for Filipino representation. Oh, that's fabulous. That's what I, you know, because on a Friday evening, that's the one thing that I want. I'm always saying to you, oh my God, I really want to see something with Filipino representation. Watershed, yeah. And most Massive. people, most people actually obviously don't agree. I wouldn't mind seeing a sitcom or a rom-com with Filipinos you know, in it and set it in, set in some, but like you just don't know. You don't. You just. Don't I, don't, be, I don't. I don't want. You don't want to tick a box. I don't want to know that it's a. I, if I see it's a watershed moment for Filipino representation, but I that's will like, run right, a mile. I'm, yes, that's I mean, a, yeah, yeah. What's that? Crazy rich Asians, like fabulous. Uh, is there we any? I don't that. think there's any white people in that. Is no, there but it was all? great. We it, was that. Quite, it was wonderful. Uh, yeah. But you know. But they didn't. But they didn't say this is a breakthrough moment for Asian tele. You know that wasn't no, the advert. The adver- it was very much actually. It was very much pushed as kind of super glamorous, which is yes. obviously what most people are actually are interested in. Super glamorous, gorgeous Asian people, and we were looking at gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous property porn. That's right. Which of course is a very particular interest of our own. Who doesn't want to look at other people's and gorgeous th- homes? Th- think about the title of it. Uh, Cra- crazy rich. It was actually slightly derogatory. Oh yeah, crazy rich Asians. of Asians, yes, right? Yes. The title now. Crazy is it, you know? So, so it was not saying to you, "Here's a watershed." In fact, saying, "Here's a, here's a, we're going to slightly criticize them," and everyone flocked to it. Everyone loved flocked it, to loved it. Loved it. Can't get people it. saw it many times. And did you know there was a there's a TV series called Miss Marvel? Oh, funny. I yes, I I've read I've read about that. Have you? But it's not the marvelous Miss Maisel. It's Miss, Miss Marvel. Ms. Tell us Marvel. what's the what's the uh, concept here, Phil? She's a teenage Muslim superhero. Fabulous. That's what a that's female, what the world a female teenage. That's what the world needs. Muslim superhero. Yes. It has a ninety-seven percent Rotten Tomatoes rating on, from, on the critics, critics, from, from the critics. From the critics. So this critics. is from the elite critics. Yes. Now, what did the audience think, though, Phil? Uh, no, no one's watched it. Have they even got a rating? Funny, they've got a rating. They, yes, yeah, it's, it's liked by the audience, but I think that's uh, Jerry rigged. But I'd never heard of it. No one, uh, it has had really, really, really low ratings. I think the New York Times call it tepid ratings, which means zero. Disaster. Yeah. Yes. So wokeness has infected and destroyed the product, uh, but also the production process in Hollywood. Uh, how do I know this? Because dozens of, quote, 
Hollywood insiders, close mm-hmm. quote. I knew this anyway, by the way, but they told uh, the New York Times this in one of those articles that that oh, that it. is that is not saying what the author thinks it is saying, or maybe Brooke Barnes who wrote. What, the, what's really what's really great about this article is the fact that basically everyone, all the best quotes are from people who will not acknowledge them, so, who are all anonymous. Of course, and that's that, which is you know obviously then you get the good stuff. So what have we discovered? This is a great article, by the way, and we'll put up a link to the article. So yes, people so can the article's read by Brooke Barnes, and uh, he, he you know he called this maybe he's been clever and delivering. Bad, unpalatable bad news in shiny packaging. He he says the quote. You know the quotes he has are really they're devastating for this whole diversity nonsense. But but so let's let's have a let's have a quote from a senior film executive. Um, for for three years we hired nothing but women and people of color. The, the executive said. Uh, he added that he did not think some of them were able to do the jobs they got. Ouch. So they hired incompetent people in house. No, because they were yes, they, yes. they hired incompetent people because they wanted to fill quotas. Yes. So they made the quota the thing that mattered. By the way, there is no to, that, that's so that's so uh, that's so so nineties so quotas. There's no such thing as quotas What's now. What's the word it's, now? It, it's victory. It's what? Victory. It's it, you know there's no quota now. It, there is absolute and total domination. Okay. That's what they want. They don't want quotas. Uh, they, you know they don't they don't want their their. Employees to match even American population. They want they want to eradicate whiteness, er- eradicate white employees, and it's working out really well it's for them. Right. Out. So, uh, and the next quote part of is from the New York Times in hush conversations over lunch at Toscana Brentwood. Love it, Toscana yes. Brentwood. We know fabulous. Well. Love it. I don't think we've ever been there. Have I we? don't think we've been there. No. And co- we'd love to go though. Cocktails at the San Vicente bungalows. I'm sure I would that, love that. Is that those ones? That's those ones on Santa Monica, on it the boulevard, be. on Ocean Park. It might Park. be. It might be. We again another place we haven't been invited yes. to, but we're open to invitations. Yes. Some powerful producers and agents have started to question the commercial viability of inclusion-minded films and shows. Right, and it's like they haven't actually. Fully enough, they haven't. Brooke Barnes, the audience has questioned the commercial viability. You know. Yes. Um, you mean when you hire people because of their color or because of their gender or because of their non-gender uh, and then as, as they say they're not up to the job you will get a bad product um, the New York Times describes such conversations as a regression to the bad old days they and several people they talk to uh, they don't worry about making a profit or finding or pleasing an audience but losing what what they call diversity the example they use to you know this lot to talk about this loss of diversity it is so funny it actually this regression it reads like a parody now uh, this is an actual paragraph from the new york times mm-hmm. in august warner brothers discovery shelved batgirl a nearly finished movie starring a latina actress actress featuring a transgender actress in a supporting role, written by a woman, produced by women, and directed by two Muslim men. That is like a thing from The, the Onion. You know, that's, that's like a par- that is like a parody. Warner Brothers it's like someone Discovery from Babylon B. never publicly explained its decision, but signaled that it found Batgirl to be creatively lacking. Who would have thought? Who creatively have thought? lacking. Who I think creatively lacking, you... as in, I can translate creatively lacking for those of you who may not understand what it means. I think it means crap and unwatchable. Unwatchable. Of course, it's unwatchable. When you have, you know, a movie that 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 the whole reason it exists is to give have a starring role for a Latina actress featuring a transgender actress in a supporting role, written by women, produced by women, and directed by two Muslim men. My God. Like, yeah. So that huge film culture from the Muslim world yes. that they 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 were going back on, that you know, transgender. I mean, it's, it's just it's diversity at the sake of 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 interest. So, are they learning from anything? This they're not. They're do, they're doubling down now. There's a problem. They're 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 running out of money, but yes. they just are determined yes. to double down. I mean, Universal just launched an early retirement program where they were giving payouts to anyone over 57 uh, and over 10 years experience um which is basically a pretext for getting rid of old older white people mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. because that's because that's well, what they really want to do so that when want, the, so that when somebody comes along they can say oh, but look at look at all our, look at the lovely colors of all the people that we have working here yeah the here. percentages get yes. the percentages up get the percentages so they're going right. to get rid of their best storytellers their most experienced people uh they're going to and they're going to allow the 
the the shows starring a Latina actress, a transgender actress, written by a woman, produced by women, directed by two Muslim men. They're going to allow those to keep going, and there's going to be no wise older person going, hold on, guys, this is all very nice. But Let's have the white guy who's a great storyteller but stay here. But also, shouldn't we tell a story? Yeah. That's what the, yeah, that's let's what the focus older, on the story. Let's that's what an older guy's for. Listen, you're great. You're wonderful. But we just want the really great yeah. story. Let's have so, the great person rather than the, the right. So, yeah. so, you know, these people who are hired for the diversity probably can't tell great stories. Maybe some of them can. So, but it's not going to make a difference because Marx was wrong. He should have cared about the means of distribution, not, not production. Means, not production. Yeah. That is why they will still keep producing this because they have the monopoly on the means of distribution. We discovered it with My Son Hunter. Yeah. Uh, a, a great movie, a movie that was the most talked about movie of the month, maybe mm. of the year. I think Don't Worry Darling and My Son Hunter are two of the top and Top Gun Maverick, three top talked about movies. Uh, you know, created enormous uh, enormous media. Enormous media, enormous debate, enormous I mean, uh, vitriol. But, you know, people were it, it drew people's attention. Could we get a, a, dist- a mainstream distribution deal? No, we went with Breitbart and we're really glad we did. Yes. And by the way, you can go and watch My Son Hunter at mysonhunter.com. You can buy the DVD. Great present for Thanksgiving. Great present for Christmas. Bar mitzvah. Christening. I don't know. Just any kind of occasion at all, actually. That's a very diverse. Uh, and uh, actually for that friend that, um, you know, the unmet friend at Thanksgiving or the met friend at Thanksgiving yes. or the unfortunate relative that you have at Thanksgiving yes. Yes. who needs to be given a present, but maybe given a present that'll, you know, give them a little education that they didn't yes. ask for. Well, you know who we're talking about. Yes. So uh, I have no solutions to the means of distribution. Uh, Elon Musk, interestingly enough, took over one means of distribution. Yes. And, yes. you know, if he'd have taken over a, a movie studio, the vitriol wouldn't have been as bad. But you, you see that he took over Twitter. Mm-hmm. and They don't like it. They don't like it because it's a means of distribution. Yep. Maybe he should start distributing TV series and movies through um, Twitter. We'd be very encouraging of him doing such a thing. Yes. Or any other people who care about free speech and care about div- actual diversity of thought rather than diversity of skin color or sexuality. That, you know, that, that the diversity of thought is, is what's missing at the moment. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, you know, as I said earlier, thank you for all of that film. Very interesting and and, and depressing, actually, yeah. by the way, because um, because of the way things are with distribution, it means that, you know, so many stories are not getting told. Yes. And that's basically who we are. The that's un- what we are. The, the Unreported Story Society is exactly, ex- ex- exactly what we are. And we have some very exciting projects we're going to be working on next year, and we will be bringing all news of that to you over, but, over the next Would you like next to year. help us make interesting projects next year, please go to the unreportedstorysociety.com. Actually, we have just... We yeah, we have actually, funny enough, that's right, we've got, we have a donor who has donated $50,000 that needs to be matched. I think we've so far raised, I think, seventeen or 18000 of that, but if you could get involved and give us a donation right now at unreportedstorysociety.com. It'll basically be doubled, which yes. um, is So is every, every $100 you give is worth $200 and it's tax deductible, the $100 that is. So we're coming to the end of the show and I just want to uh, talk about the recipe. So um, this is a great recipe. We have a friend who was not feeling well and she's vegan. And I know the word vegan, it makes me almost... Burst, very, burst into tears. It's very you know? un-American. And it's very un and Ann. And we have the figures to prove it, by the way. So, um, but I actually found a fabulous recipe um, and I made, I was making soup for the, for my friend, basically, who just got over the, from a, from a surgery, basically. And I found this recipe in the New York Times and I've changed it a little bit, but oh my God, what a great recipe. Coconut butternut squash soup. It's vegan, as I said, but it's not even slightly sad or tragic. So for that, you're going to need, here's like, I, there's a picture of the, of the ingredients you need. Butternut squash, olive oil, oil, onion, um, vegetable broth again because it's vegan, curry powder, ginger, nutmeg, a can of coconut milk, get the full fat coconut milk, salt and freshly ground pepper. And basically you can bake the squash in the oven. But of course, as usual with me, um, I decided to try out baking the squash in the air fryer. Brilliant. Uh, To take the bottom of squash, what we're going to do is Uh, I would cut that up and if you do have an air fryer which I highly recommend I would put it to 400 and cut up the butternut squash into rough pieces or whatever and put it in there and it takes a lot of cooking to soften that butternut squash so if you put it in the oven it's going to be it's going to be a long enough process I think it took us Phil and what I think it was like 30 or 40 minutes in the air fryer and what you want to do surprisingly long what you want to do with that with that butternut squash is you want to make it you put a a knife into it and the knife goes into it easily one problem with an air fryer is it's small right and it can become 
become overcrowded, where an oven is 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 sure. allows you more freedom and the stuff. Is we it, were able to to do this uh, this uh, butternut saying. squash. So I'm saying that's how you start the recipe anyway. You, you want to soften that butternut squash by baking it either in the oven or if you're in if you have an air fryer, I recommend the air fryer. Anyway, add an onion, nice um, onion that you've cut up very quietly. Um, not huge. By the way, you don't have to be too you don't have to be too crazy about how you chop these things up because you're going to end up everything's going to get end up being uh, <laughs> blended being blended in some ways add the onion and saute over a medium low heat until golden about 8 to 10 minutes then add the apple squash broth and spices and again you're using vo- vegetable broth for this because it's a vegan recipe bring it to a steady simmer then cover and simmer gently until the apples are tender about 10 minutes and then what you want to do is using a slotted spoon you see we're doing that there we're going to transfer the solids into the food processor um, and we have this ninja food process which is very 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 loud too loud by the way I think for anybody I, I really regret buying it in a way it's just, I don't know why it's so loud it's horrible <laughs> But it does work brilliantly. And so you want to b- make, bring those solids down and make them into a paste, then transfer them back into the pot. And then you add the coconut milk. And you just, you know, heat that up and bring it back to a simmer. Don't, obviously, once you've made the soup, always remember this, don't be bringing the soup to a boil again. You just bring yes. it to a simmer. Big, big um, thing. Let it sit for a while. Ideally, I would let that sit for two or three hours before you get to serve I, I think it and bring did, it back to the boil again, you know. Did you say bring it back to a simmer, I should say again. Season with salt and pepper or something? You're seasoning with sal- salt and pepper. As I said, the whole recipe, by the way, is, is going to be in the notes. And you're using some nutmeg in there too. But this is such a great recipe. Um, I really highly recommend it. Really, really gorgeous and very warming for this crazy cold time of year film. I mean, mm-hmm. it's bizarre how cold it is oh, here. Freezing. Sure, we're nearly, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Freezing. Anyway, we've come to the we end the heat of, on. we have the heating on. Imagine us with the heating on with the old fossil fuels. Thanks be to God while we still have them. Yes. While we still have them, we have the fossil fuels going to keep the house warm. We have indeed. Um, that's the end of our show today thank you so much for tuning in for being our friend I know everyone's getting prepared for Thanksgiving we'll talk more about Thanksgiving next week which is Thanksgiving week obviously and don't forget go to MiceOnHunter.com mm-hmm. and and download the movie or or buy a DVD again a great pres- Christmas present and if you want to support our work you can go to the unreportedstorysociety.com as I said we have a matching 50,000 uh, donation right now which, Very important. We, which we need which we need to match before the end of the year. Yeah. So you'll be or we lose the... Or we lose the money, yeah. which would not be a good thing. No. Uh, so thank you very much for all of that and we'll be talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.